Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Daria Yudakevsky, and I am the Executive Director of USC Visions and Voices, the Arts and Humanities Initiative. On behalf of Visions and Voices and our partner, Asian Pacific American Student Services, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month event, California Dreaming, Asian American Arts, Culture, and Place. As we come together for this program, I want to open by acknowledging the indigenous land that we share. I am privileged to work at the University of Southern California, whose campuses were built on the sacred land of the Tongva, Chumash, and Keech people. We honor them and all indigenous people, past, present, and future, and their continued survival and contributions to our society. We also honor the legacy of the African diaspora and recognize that this country would not exist without the enslaved labor of Black people. We share these acknowledgments to raise awareness about histories that are too often erased or forgotten, to recognize our place in this history, and to affirm our commitment to social change. The connections between land, diaspora, and social change also bring me to tonight's program. Our conversation will feature several wonderful writers, artists, and scholars who have contributed to the new book, California Dreaming, Movement and Place in the Asian American Imaginary. It is now my pleasure to introduce one of the editors of California Dreaming, Lucy Burns. Lucy is also the author of Puro Arte, Filipinos on the Stages of Empire, and she's a professor of Asian American Studies at UCLA. Please welcome Lucy Burns. Great, thank you so much. Um, so first, thank you to USC's Voices and Visions um, for featuring our collection, California Dreaming Movement and Place in the Asian American Imaginary. Um, I joined this session from the unceded land of the Gambrelino Tongva peoples and I'm dialing in from a neighborhood in Los Angeles, Califas, founded on one of the first expropriated indigenous lands in California. Um, I want to thank Daria, Marie, and David for making us part of this program and for the care they put into hosting us today. Um, Marie, if you could share the screen. Thank you. All right, so it's, it was an honor to work on this multi-genre collection, one that brings together 27 entries from 29 contributor, contributors featuring works by and about Asian American artists based in California. As you can see from this uh, next uh, slide, sorry. Great. So as you can see from this table of contents, this collection is ambitious in its reach and scope, as well as in its critical reimagining of California, the Golden State beyond the frontier mentality. As discussed by my brilliant co-editor and co-laborer, Christine Balance in her introduction, these works collectively offer a translocal, regional, and archipelagic understanding of place and cultural production. We also want to acknowledge all the people at the University of Hawaii Press who kindly and patiently saw this book through its publication. So before I introduce our panel panelists today, uh, or for today, I'd like to give a big shout out and much love to all the contributors and all the terrific graduate student assistants who helped us with this book. Um, so some of the contributors um, are actually maybe with us today uh, in the audience. We are honored to have you as part of this collection and we're great, grateful for your support and always inspired by your work. So thank you so much. All right. I will now move on to our, um, for today's panelists, I'll introduce them and then um, they'll say a little bit of, um, of what their contributions in, in the collection. So we'll start with Professor Nayan Shah. <clears throat> so Nayan, uh, Nayan Shah is a professor of American studies um, and ethnicity and history at USC. Uh, Professor Shaw is the author of Contagious Divides and Stranger Intimacy. Both books, wonderful, wonderful books, uh, are published by the University of California Press. So Nayan, please uh, tell, uh, just 
speak a little bit about your um, contribution to the collection? Uh, sure, my, my contribution to the collection was trying to embrace my parents' love affair for the national parks and their various adventures there and think about that in relationship to early 20th century Asian American artists, uh, particularly Obata, Choya Obata, whose work was just really inspiring for rethinking my own experiences at Yosemite. Thank, thank you. All right. We'll hear more from Nayan. So please don't go away if you're just here for Nayan. <laughs> Nayan will be with us for the entire hour. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Maider Vang, Maider Vang, who is the Assistant Professor of English in Creative Writing at California State University, Fresno. Um, is Maider on? Yes, great. So Maider is also the author of a tremendous, tremendous collection of poetry titled Afterland, published by um, Grey Wolf Press in 2017. And it is the recipient of the Walt Whitman Award in 2016. Uh, Maider, if you could tell us a little bit about your contribution in the collection. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Lucy, um, for um, for that introduction. And thanks to everyone for being here, to our gracious hosts and editors, obviously, who organized this event and brought us together. Um, I'm thrilled to have four of my poems included in this anthology, Original Bones, Beyond the Backyard, Crash Calling, and Late Harvest, all of which appeared in my first collection, um, and all of which explore in some way uh, my connection to the Central Valley region of California as a daughter of Hmong refugees. I'm looking forward to hearing from my fellow panelists and just want to thank you all again for, for being here. Thank you, Maider. Um, okay, so now I'd like to call on um, Lan Duong. So Lan Duong is a professor in cinema and media studies at the University of Southern California, our wonderful institutional host for today. Uh, and um, Lan is uh, the author of Treacherous Subjects, Gender, Culture, and Trans-Vietnamese Feminisms, uh, a wonderful book published by Temple University in 2012. Uh, Lan, please uh, tell us what, what your, your wonderful, about your wonderful entry in the book. Thank you, Lucy, and thank you everybody for coming. I'm so excited to be here. It's my first um, appearance at a Visions and Voices event and um, happy to be here. <laughs> happy to be also within this collection of such strong writers and voices um, who and whose work I've uh, long admired. Um, but my work in the uh, collection is about, is called Traveling Subjects and the Subjects of Travel in Vietnamese Diasporic Films. And I just um, thought of <clears throat> thinking about dreaming and imagining how um, Vietnamese uh, diasporic subjects uh, do travel to Vietnam or imagine such travel uh, through um, these travel videos that I found in Little Saigon. So I hope to talk a little bit more about that as the evening continues. Thank you. Um, okay, so our, our next panelist that I'd like to introduce is Karen Yamashita, KT. So Karen Yamashita is the author of numerous books uh, and I could only name a few here for today, including um, The Tropic of Orange, uh, Circle K Cycles, I Hotel, Anime Wong, Fictions of Performance, and Letters to Memory. All of these books are published by Coffee House Press and put together have won many, many, many awards. So KT, please uh, tell us about your piece in the collection. Hi, thank you, Lucy. and. Uh... Thank you, uh, Christine. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, okay. So I've been looking here, what did I do? It's, um, it is a, a television sitcom, a script, and uh, I created it actually for another uh, a book. It was for Anime Wong. And uh, there's a trio of work, but this particular thing was my attempt to do a, 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 a television sitcom uh, for an Asian American um, audience and, and cast. Uh, 
And of course, it's a satire. We can talk more about it later. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. And yes, looking forward to hearing more about it um, in this session. And I'd like now to introduce Wendy Chang, who is the, an assistant professor in American studies at Scripps College. Um, Wendy is the author of another terrific, terrific book. I love this book, uh, The Chang's Next Door to the Diaz's Remapping Race in Suburban California, published by the University of Minnesota Press in 2013. Um, Wendy, please tell us about your piece in California Dreaming. Thank you so much, Lucy. And thank you to everyone for being here and to uh, Lucy and Christine for editing this collection that I'm so honored to be part of. Um, so my piece in the anthology is an essay with both original and archival photographs and text, and it's titled Of Railroads, Camps, and Strip Malls, Symbolic Landscapes of the San Gabriel Valley. And it's a reflection and an attempt to expand the kinds of spaces that are associated with Asian American um, history, culture, and racialization. And it includes both kind of elite and mundane places such as gardens and um, suburban strip malls and reflects on how these can offer us um, powerful and nuanced understandings of Asian American histories and relationships to everyday landscapes. And I'm looking forward to being in conversation with everyone. Thank you, Wendy. And uh, finally, but not the least of all, I'd like to introduce my co-editor, my kapatid, Christine Bacaras Balance, who is Associate Professor um, of Asian American Studies at Cornell University, and also the author of the award-winning book titled Tropical Renditions, Making Musical Scenes in Filipino America, published by Duke uh, University in 2016. Christine, please um, say a little something about <laughs> your contribution to this collection. No, I just wanted to echo everyone's thanks um, again to USC Vision and Voices for sponsoring tonight, uh, but most of all to my co-laborer, collaborator, Kapatid, um, Lucy Burns, this, uh, as well as these contributors for um, not just kind of providing your own faith in us as editors, but doing so over almost a decade. <laughs> so we thank you for your patience and your ongoing support and thank everyone who's here and I'm really excited for the conversation. Thank you, Christine. And again, thank you to all of you, our, our wonderful panelists um, for joining us today and also to the contributors. Um, who we will feature hopefully in other conversations um, in, the, in the very, very near future. Um, so for now, I'd like to move now to our different pairings. So we, we had set up something quite different for, for our event today. Um, we would like to focus our conversations on creative processes, both as an object of analysis and also a method to explore renderings of California as a specific locale, as well as an identity marker that moves linking its culture, labor, and economy with Asia Pacific, the Americas, and the world. So this part of this afternoon's session now will be conducted in pairs. Um, the first two contributors who will be in conversation will be Nine Shaw and Mai Dervang. Um, and then it'll be followed by uh, Lan Duong and I will be in a conversation. And then lastly, but not the least, Wendy Chang and Karen Numashta. So um, each pairings will talk for about um, together for about seven, eight minutes, and then um, we'll come back together and, and hopefully engage with our wonderful audience. Hello. Hey, Miter. It's so wonderful to be in conversation with you. I so enjoyed the four poems you shared here, and I'm sure it was really hard to figure out what you were going to share with us in this anthology, but I was so struck by how um, I was, I was feeling when I, as I read each poem, which was each one is very different, um, but there are some ties that go through them. And I was thinking a lot about how the sonic and how the visual is just erupting in different ways. And I wanted to know a little bit more about these individual poems. What were you thinking about um, as you were both creating them and also just selecting them for to share in this anthology? 
Yeah, well, that's a that's a great question, Nye, and I appreciate you for asking that and and sort of thinking about the process behind these poems. Um, you know, I think that for me, I well, you know, I shared in my introduction that um, you know, growing up as a daughter of Hmong refugees, um, you know, it was sort of, you know, just part of my my sense of space and location and just overall geography was just the home but also home as in the central valley of california which is where i'm from and actually i'm going to flip a question on you in a while too because you know i mean you wrote about uh yosemite and these are these are these are uh, spaces that are also very near and dear to where i am um but um but yeah the um as far as thinking about those poems in particular um i'm glad you brought up the sonic qualities, because I think for me, as a poet, um, I'm really attentive to sound. Um, and I didn't realize that until probably recently when I started to think about um, the ways that I was uh, exploring syllabic, uh, you know, cadences in the words that I was choosing, and also in thinking about language growing up as a as a as Hmong being my first language, too. So, um, and Hmong also being a very tonal and monosyllabic language. Um, a lot of that really sort of kind of became part of the landscape of these poems, um, the, the, the sonic landscape, right? Um, and then of course the visual too, as you pointed out, um, which I know is when you read some of these poems and you look at some of the other ones that I've written in the collection, um, I've gotten all kinds of interesting comments from people about the images <laughs> from, wow, these are, crazy to, I have no idea what you're doing in these films, <laughs> um, which has been great, right? You know, I, I'm okay with that. But um, but I love the ability of language to be able to explore um, the possibilities of what landscape can mean, right, mm -hmm. to each one of us. Um, yeah. yeah, and there's, so, and there's just these fierce juxtapositions. Uh, so there, I think I can imagine when readers are saying, I, I didn't expect that. Uh, it's because you're like in, um, you know, as you said, in the Central Valley, and you're both talking about like in in late harvest about like what you would imagine the Central Valley to have this this harvested fruit uh, or this fruit that's abundant, uh, yet no one to to pick it or harvest it, and then in others you're like in landscapes which seem like, um, you know, they're not bucolic at all. They're just like. You know this really intensity of um, the wind whipping through, um, you know, what seems to be rusted and corroded machinery or, or space, and I, I just really think that's important to sort of put in there because, um, it, you know, my experience of being in the Central Valley myself is I started doing research in places like Tulare and Kern County, and I was going to county courthouses, and it was as I spent more and more time there. It was not what I anticipated. Uh, it was, and it was also much more incredibly heterogeneous with people of all kinds from all over the world, which I certainly experienced historically in early 20th century, but to see it also be part of the 21st century was also really important. So I really appreciate that in your work. Cool, thanks, yeah. Yeah, the Valley is a really interesting place. I mean, a polarizing opposites and and all kinds of sort of just uh, histories uh, coming together. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you got to come through for a little bit. Um, and, and then now I want to sort of turn it over to you, to you and, and talk more about your work as well, because I, I really enjoyed your essay and your discussion on place and belonging. And I appreciated how you, uh, as you mentioned in your intro, how you contextualized that sense of belonging um, in, in the California wilderness, first through your parents' love for the national parks and their trip to Yosemite, right? And secondly, through the visual art of Asian American artists, particularly the work of Obata and his renderings of Yosemite. And so, you know, for myself having grown up, um, you know, in, in, sort of in proximity to the Sierra Nevada mountains, I, I, I found your essay to be quite resonant. Um, and I thought you had so many great opening questions in that essay. They were so profound. And I kind of want to take one of those essays, questions I mean, and open it up a little bit further in light of what you've shared in the essay. And also I think in light of this really fascinating and important conversation and discourse that's been happening around this idea also of returning the national parks to indigenous peoples. And you asked in one of the questions um, whether or not a person's history 
um, and origin impacts their aesthetic of engagement with and ethics of relating to rock, water, flora, and fauna. And I found that really fascinating um, as it relates to people um, like my parents and, and people in my community who have been uprooted or displaced refugees or those who are in exile who have fled maybe from one mountain to another mountain or one landscape to another landscape. And I'm wondering if you could just share a little bit more on your thinking behind that question or maybe even how you would potentially answer that question yourself. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great, great thing to throw back the question. I mean, I think these, it's also worth sort of saying that 10 years ago, many of us gathered and talked about this work um, and started the conversation that led to this anthology. I think the questions I was throwing out was re were really about how I was trying to reckon with, um, you know, the experience I have um, traversing uh, the landscape of the Western United States in a way that I grew up in, in uh, Maryland and I love the landscape in Maryland. It's really very soothing and calming and also really rich for me, but I have been over, overwhelmed and awestruck, um, but also very comfortable in the, the traversing and hiking of uh, the Western United States, which started really for me over the last, um, I guess, 23 years or so. I mean, like just, but it, it goes deeper. My parents, um, and I was reflecting on that, I'm gonna do this thing where I'm gonna share some images um, to give some context to this. Um, so let me try to do that. And can you see my screen? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, let me let me just sort of begin this. Um, so I call the piece "Central Labor of Claiming Place," and I just thought about how people work and labor through it. This is a photograph my father took in 1963. Um, they were, uh, my parents were uh, students that came uh, to the US and they, they were not displaced peoples, but they were displaced in the ways in which they were here. And they were living in the East Coast. And as soon as they got a car in 1963, a Rambler, they started traveling everywhere. And I've just really, uh, this is, uh, I believe this is like a, a bend of a river near the Tetons. Um, but I was really intrigued by the fact that something of my parents, which I experienced in Yosemite in 2010, is that they just love um, sort of feeling a part of and wanting to sort of take in the, the sensuality of it, the sound, the, the, the sort of music of the birds, the, uh, the feeling of the rocks. And they uh, are physically sort of not just joyfully involved at a distance, but really just coming right in. And in a way that like my father captured of these photographs of my mother in 1963. And we, you know, we were going through this sort of process of uh, going through their old slides. And I was just so wonderstruck by uh, this. This picture is actually Yosemite, is, is Yellowstone Falls, not Yosemite. Uh, but just the ways in which they uh, tried to through journeying across the country and through visiting national parks, found a place that they could call, uh, a place that summoned them, a place that felt like it was a spiritual connection, a place that felt like they could be in that landscape and share it with other people that were also there. Um, and their, in their case, probably mostly tourists. Uh, so I think the question that you're asking as well about who has claim of belonging to a place, who makes that claim is a really challenging one. I mean, it's my colleague, uh, David Trier, who, um, who you know, put out this proposal that's also been spoken of many times before in the Atlantic recently about returning the national parks to indigenous peoples to their stewardship. And I think it's a really important question to raise. What is this, um, this space? What is its, um, its purpose? who can take care of it, uh, who believes in it. Um, and I think for my sense of how the thing that my parents wanted to convey was how much they um, embrace the kind of magnificence and overwhelmingness that the landscape would provide them in a way that was very much like Obata. Um, and Obata, you know, I was so amazed by the 
this exhibit I saw in 2009, which only appeared in San Francisco um, at the De Young, but it was an extraordinary exhibit of Asian American artists. And I was, um, so many of them were in, in natural and fantasy landscapes, but really sort of took on landscapes. And Obata, um, you know, really worked on trying to not only do watercolors and drawings, but he would also then take those watercolors um, as uh, you know, a young artist in Berkeley and a faculty member, and then go to Japan and work with um, wood cutting um, and, and block printing and how he would use this as an opportunity to sort of deepen a kind of labor and love of the space um, that he would you know, create and imagine these layers. And you know, there's 177 panels that were created uh, to produce these woodblock prints that were placed on each other. And I, I found that just an amazing, um, I'll stop sharing my screen now, but I'll just, um, you know, found it an amazing way in which the grappling with the experience of the lived inness of uh, being in a place uh, was really important to how um, people communicate their sense of connection and belonging and to what they could communicate that to. Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing. And thanks also for, uh, for inviting us into those photos as well. So I think we're out of time, Lizzie. Yep. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Nine and Miner. And Nine, I'm amazed you were able to share those just stunning photographs of your father and to see your parents. Um, it's, I'm, 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 I love it. It's so beautiful. And thank you for that beautiful conversation. And I, one thing before I call on our lawn to join me is I want to thank you both for writing about Central Valley, the amazing work that you, you've done, Miter, with, you know, this poetry, but also the other work that you've done. Um, and Nyan, the, the re historical research, um, that, that essay for me that opens in Tulare, uh, um, that's it. I'm saying this because I, I my family moved to Central Valley. <laughs> and the one of the pieces that the entry I have in here actually talks about, um, you know, an immigrant family dealing with a Kirby uh, vacuum cellar in Porterville. So, <laughs> so yeah, I just I just want to thank you both for having that bringing that voice and also call on Don Mabalon, who's the other person who writes about um, whose entry here is also about uh, Central Valley in Stockton. So thank you both so much. Uh, Lan, please join me. Now we get to have a conversation. <laughs> thank Great. you. And can I say, Lucy, that um, we, have, we share a lot of um, connections, actually, because uh, your work is called uh, Vacuuming Dreams. Uh, and it's about a Kirby, or it's about the family, but um, in, in its encounter with a Kirby salesman. Um, and I have to say that when we were refugee families, uh, when we are a refugee family, and we moved to California in 1980, uh, my sister became a Kirby vacuum cleaner <laughs> representative. So there was, there's just a lot of uh, details in your essay that were so, that brought me um, back to uh, this time, this moment in time. And um, so as another connection, my work, it, my piece in this essay is also about dreams and how it becomes imagined in travel films. Right. Thank you, Lon. I was actually thinking more about um, the yeah your your piece in here and and travel. And I guess I, the first thing I wanted to ask you is kind of to think about the the inspiration for for the essay. Um, yeah, and and the idea of travel, and then what kind of the 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 medium of film thus to our, our, you know, what does it do in terms of our relationship to travel, ideas of travel are in, in particular, when I say ours, it, I actually mean um, the folks that you're talking about, Vietnamese, right? The Vietnamese American diaspora. Um, so yeah, if you could just peek about that a little bit. Thanks. Yeah, no, um, so great. The <clears throat> inspiration for the, the piece is actually um, going to Little Saigon and seeing piles and piles of travel videos and um, trying to figure out why they were so um, 
popular, uh, cheaply done and cheaply um, um, priced. Um, and what what was in them. So I think net thinking about, because I remember talking to both you and Christine and a bunch of us at UC Irvine, this was like 10 years ago. And this was, we were, you were dreaming up this anthology then. Uh, but now I think it has a special resonance because of the ways that we are grounded now we can't leave. Um, I have family here in the US who can't go back to Vietnam because of the pandemic. And um, it, ironically, Vietnam has been so good about um, its um, pandemic measures uh, or COVID measures. But so um, I, I started to think, well, uh, how do refugees um, travel uh, to Vietnam and how do they dream about uh, the return. This was because um, for a very long time the state uh, denied the, uh, the existence even of Vietnamese refugees, calling them traitors, um, and on the uh, Vietnamese re refugee side within California, especially in uh, Orange County where there's a very conservative um, community, uh, mostly conservative community there, who refused to go back to Vietnam because of the, the communist politics. Um, there, I tried to think about the ways that people um, revisited the, their homeland again through um, these kinds of videos. So, but these videos were also really interesting because they were titled like things like a thousand and one ways to party in Vietnam and or you know how to be um, a returning Vietnamese or Viet Q and um, make money. I mean the it was they're really salacious some of these videos because they allowed this um, the the camera was all seeing um, partying all night um, and it showed this uh, Vietnam that you didn't normally see in America and movies or in even Vietnamese American movies where Vietnam was often a signifier for poverty and um, um, gendered feminine. Uh, these videos showed uh, a traveling eye, um, a traveling subject, uh, somebody who went from North Vietnam to South Vietnam and really enjoyed food, enjoyed the sights and sounds, uh, so talk about a sonic landscape. Um, it, there were so many, there's so many details in these videos that I think uh, allowed for the person who couldn't return home um, for economic and political reasons um, to re-experience Vietnam in such a stimulating way. And um, I, I just thought it was fascinating that these videos were being made. Um, and um, I, I thought about the consumer um, and the ways in which they were, uh, they beckoned um, the diaspora home uh, through these audio uh, visual images and sounds. Great, thank you, Lon, for that. Um, what I, I was thinking about the other, kind of who, uh, your piece in conversation with a number of other works that, that really think about this transnational um, circulation of arts and also the transnational art artist organizing, right? Um, and one of those pieces in here is, um, was written by, uh, um, by Viet Nguyen, right? And then also- Sorry, Lucy, it's Viet Le. Viet Le, thank you. <laughs> By Viet Le, of course, of course, right. And um, where Viet Le sort of invokes this idea of transnational um, exchanges uh, of, of different kinds of kind of artistic projects between um, and amongst artists in Vietnam and Cambodia. Um, and then I'm also thinking about Joyce Liu's conversation and, and piece about um, Alleluia Panisse. Uh, and Cool Arts Inc. in San Francisco, where she, um, part of what she writes about is this um, Cool Arts tribal tour uh, that Alilia Panis and Cool Arts have sponsored since 1995. Um, this kind of artist exchange between, um, you know, kind of Alilia bringing um, Filipino American artists 
to the Philippines, um, but outside of Manila, outside of, you know, kind of the one urban space, <laughs> or not one, sorry, <laughs> but that, you know, the, outside of the capital into, uh, into Mindanao, right, which is an area that is um, at times at odds, actually, with the Philippine state, right? Um, so I was, I'm just struck by these alternative routes that artists, like, in their kind of efforts to keep working together and imagining and and boundaries differently right um and how so yeah that's that's the other thing that those are some of the things that your piece again in conversation with others brings up for me is this alternative roots and alternative roots um not just kind of to, to traverse but to create but also alternative ways of working together Yes. Okay, great. And I'm so glad that you brought up um, Joyce's work and, and Viet. And by the way, I often have to say Viet Le and Viet Nguyen, because both of them are, <laughs> I work with them um, very closely. So um, anyway, so but with Viet Le's work, uh, or his piece in this anthology, it's, uh, it, uh, it, there's a lot of rhyming between his his piece and my piece, especially because of the kinds of transnational imaginaries that we are um, thinking through. Because, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Vietnamese diaspora for a very long time felt that they couldn't return home. And then the state uh, has, for a very long time, um, denied the existence of refugees. Now, however, with its um, um, accession into the WTO and um, with other organizations like ASEAN, uh, Vietnam has often has now beckoned to the diaspora in order for them to return as tourists and investors and artists. So there is this redundant, uh, re, uh, re, uh, what is it? This really exciting and vital circulation between um, California and Vietnam, between um, Ho Chi Minh City and Saigon. And a lot of the artists that I know are have returned to Vietnam, not only to return, but actually to stay and make films, make art, and, and some of their work then travels back to the US. So that circulation is um, rebounds, I think, with a lot of energy and vitality. Um, and it, it, it's also a reflection of the different political uh, conditions um, that have, um, that have really created these um, these uh, modes of travel for people, ideas, money, finances, um, and so it's a reflection too of U.S. Vietnam relations, but also the relations between uh, the state and uh, the Vietnamese American community. Okay, thank you, Lon. I know um, we have to move on to our next pair, but thank you so much for holding this conversation with me. Um, and then we'll we'll see you in a few minutes. Um, now I'll call on Wendy and Katie. Karen Yamashita, please. Hi, Wendy. Hi. Um, so, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, you go first then. Okay. Or no, okay oh, I'll go first. Wait, wait. <laughs> oh, please go ahead. All right. You like. So um, I, I, I was really um, interested in your your piece, it's, it's historical and geographical, and it, um, well, hey, I can read a piece, right? Is, isn't that what we were asked to do? Let's let yes. me find it. Oh, here it is. Um, let me, it opens this way. In 2008, the Garden of the Flowing Fragrance, uh, a lavish Chinese garden at the Huntington Library and Gardens in the wealthy enclave of San Marino in Los Angeles, San Gabriel Valley, open to the public. And I do remember this because I saw it early on without, without the water. You could just see the rocks and, and the building of that, which it stunned me because now that is all covered up. So we don't see all that construction, which was really quite fascinating. Anyway, you say, go on to say the irony that this garden celebrating elite Chinese culture and funded by Asian American and Trans-Pacific Capital was situated on the estate of railroad magnate Henry Huntington, 
whose fortune had been made on the backs of poor Chinese laborers was not lost on some. And I think that's true, was not lost on me. Yeah. And, and then you go on to say the garden of flowing fragrance is indicative, indicative of the layered histories and complexities of Asian American history and experience in places like contemporary suburban Los Angeles, the San Gabriel Valley where the Huntington Estate is located is an emblematic region in making, in the making of contemporary Asian America. It is a dynamic semi-suburban area of loosely connected munis municipalities that is home to the largest concentration of Asian Americans in the United States. And I was thinking, whoa, uh, what, what, I, what I wanted to say was, I, I've been doing this work with Los Angeles and, and uh, California for a while. And I'm always struck by the geography, I think, and the sort of the, the construction of layers or this excavation of history that we, we've lost because we've built on top of it. And yet that, 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 um, that history waits for us to ex excavate, I think. And so I was thinking, you know, in terms of your creative process, what, what, how were you, what were you, I mean, I, I, you chose this geographic area and you, 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 you rode and drove through it, but how did that work for your, your creation of the piece? Yeah, so I think, um, thank you. And um, let me just say it's such a pleasure to have you read my work because um, I got to, you actually let me email you by inter, uh, interview you by email 16 years ago when I was oh. a graduate student. <laughs> and I actually published an interview with you. Um, so long time a fan oh, of your okay. work. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm, um, I'm a geographer and I'm also a writer. And then um, this essay was an opportunity to, to think through in a more uh, form-free way, you know, um, things that I had already been doing in my other work. You know, one is the book Lucy mentioned, The Chang Next Door to the Diaz's about the San Gabriel Valley. And the other one is A People's Guide to Los Angeles, which I um, co-wrote with Laura Polito and Laura Bearcroft, which is trying to, um, Kind of bring the critical insights of geography to a broader audience you know and um like nyan and like so many others i'm i'm in love with landscape you know because i was actually a landscape photographer before i went to graduate school and what i love about landscape is that it offers this kind of um present facing entry point for everyone to think about their place in relationship to uh, what cultural ge geographers talk about as the sedimentation of social relationships and histories over time, right? So um, that one passage that you read, right, the Huntington Chinese Garden, it's it's such a way to start digging up those layers. Um, and it's a way that contradictions can coexist, right? So you can put that narrative of, you know, the donor who says, I feel so proud of the progress Chinese people have made, right? Um, but then um, put that in contrast with um, the fortune of the Huntington family being built on the um, exploited and dangerous and often deadly labor of Chinese workers, right, who built the transcontinental railroads, you know, so I'm very interested in seeing how those contradictions coexist within one site and landscape. Um, that was a long answer, but I want to, <laughs> um, I think we're a little more than halfway through our allotted time, um, so yeah. I just wanted to um, kind of but back and I actually wanted to read part of your piece as well because I don't think um, a summary can cover how it feels to be in that text. Um, so uh, this is you know part of um, uh, Karen's abstraction to television sitcom from Dental Optics. So I'm just gonna read the opening scene. Um, Fade in exterior Gardena neighborhood day. Pan, Japanese American aspects of the neighborhood, Japanese gardens with perfect dichondra lawns and lollipop bushes, local restaurants, shops, cultural centers, Buddhist temples, and Baptist churches. Follow red RX-7 Mazda into mini mall parking lot in front of offices of dental optic, optics. Um, sound of Asian American jazz fusion, oxymoron, and shakuhachi, voiceover. In the mid 60s, two healthy twin baby boys were born to a sansei couple in Gardena, California. The couple, known Asian American movement radicals, had made a con conscientious decision to live and work in the community and chose Gardena, a small working class city on the greater metropolitan outskirts of LA, 
where an Asian American enclave continued to thrive. With faith in the power of the people, they raised and educated their boys to epitomize mentally and physically the very perfection of Asian America. Indeed, the two boys grew to be men like, unlike any others, mentally astute, sensitive, visionary, politically active, artistic, and physically exquisite. The only imperfection, a word denied by the boys and their parents, was the inconvenience of being bound to each other near the hip by a thick, fleshy ligament. Since words like oriental and cyan were considered passe, the boys were heroically referred to as the Asian American duo. Heko and Okada emerged from sports car, sound of Taiko, and then it dissolves to mix. Um, so that's just to give everyone who hasn't read it a flavor. And the question I wanted to ask you um, was uh, just a question of um, how you work through stereotypes and humor in your creative process, because you're, you're often working with very kind of like, um, um, heavy and complex political moments you know um so so i'm just wondering how you kind of bring that together right these these more kind of like um heavy histories with with um stereotypes and humor oh i, I don't know how to answer that <laughs> um how do i do it well I, I just put it together i think uh the story started um because of my my, I got upset at one day. I said, well, why, why are we Siamese twin, twins and mongoloids? And so that was, that was what, um, what initiated my, um, my query. And then I, I went to look at the Siamese twins and then read about them. And they are, well, they're, in a sense, they're, they're maybe the first Asian Americans. All, and, but at the same time, there's also, um, a man named jo Joseph Hecko, and his name was Hecko. Um, no, jo Joseph Hecko. He was um, he's Hecko Hamada, right? And uh, he came to the United States from Japan and was was the first Japanese to be ever ever naturalized as a citizen here. So I pulled him into it, changed the names, and um, also put in John Okada as. So all of these naming, this naming is also brings on the layers that you're talking about of, of these characters and then adds sort of, but, but the fact that they're um, attached to each other as uh, twins um, is farcical. And of course they can't um, be apart it. So, <clears throat> but they have this, uh, again, they have this sort of stereotypical um, characters one is a dentist and one is an optometrist and they open uh, their uh, offices together, but they have to be together because the chairs have to be together and one works on someone's teeth and the other person works on um, the, the eyes of, the other, of another patient. And I'm just trying to screw around with this. And at the same time, they have, they have um, a secret or a, uh, um, secret um, identities. So they're Chang and Ang, who are the original names of the, the so-called Siamese twins of the civil, of that, of that period, the 19th century. And um, they, um, they run around as, as kind of spies and uh, ninja fighters and save, um, save the community uh, from itself, I guess. So, and in this particular case, uh, it has to do with redlining uh, districts and um, the, uh, the creation of, of uh, well, white flight. Um, yeah. Well, I just love it because I think one of the things the humor does is it just opens up all of these like emotional affective spaces that are not necessarily usually attached to those histories and moments. So if there's a certain kind of like freedom in being able to feel you know, um, joy or, um, you know, humor or, um, <laughs> I don't even know how to describe the feelings, yeah. right? But oh. in relationship to these topics, but it just, it just kind of opens up the spaces of what's possible. Well, I always thought that, that we would, we should have everyone else there, you know, comedy hour, our, our sitcoms, but we, you know, we had, we have had it for very brief moments and there's a, these family, um, sitcoms and I thought this would this would work. <laughs> <laughs>
and then of course I wanted it to be in a you know a neighborhood with Asian Americans and yeah very typical neighborhood. This is one I would love to see. <laughs> then they'll never do it. <laughs> So, so talk a little, well, wait a minute. Are we, how, how is our time? Um, we are over time. Yes, we will be moving on to Q&A now. So okay. um, I should turn on my, oh, there I am. Okay. <laughs> Thank you both so much for that. And I love that you, I love the pieces that you read, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, if I was going to be in Paris with them, those were exactly the same things that I chose. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and now we'll, um, I want to invite, oh, Christine's here already, my co-editor and collaborator and collaborator um, for the anthology. Um, yes, yeah, so we'll be um, open it up for questions and comments from the audience. And I think we actually, Lucy, want to invite all the panelists up Yes. as we do the Q&A. Um, audience members, please feel free to formulate your questions and drop them either in the chat or um, in the Q&A box. Um, I do have a couple of questions, maybe just as people are warming up and to start us off. Um, this first question is, is for both my dear and Lon. Uh, thank you both again for being here um, and, and for your contributions to the collection. Um, I know, my dear, we talked in the past in terms of um, the kind of both artistic and political significance of, um, uh, of your poetry, right? And particularly thinking of yourself as, um, as a Hmong, uh, as the child of Hmong refugees and as a Hmong poet. Right, and thinking about Hmong as a, um, a people that did not have a written language right, until the 1950s and what that meant, right? So what it means now to be a poet in that tradition. Um, and then Lon, I really loved your piece in terms of thinking about, um, again, the kind of translocal circulation between um, uh, artists and filmmakers in particular, um, production companies in Vietnam and in Vietnamese America. Um, and so I guess for you both, I wondered if you could talk just a little bit more of how you see your work in, in, as it situ, situates itself in relationship to a critical refugee poetics. And I don't know if Lon or Mai wants to go first. Oh, okay, I'll, um, because you uh, interpolated me by saying, by saying critical refugee studies. Um, and so I'll just explain a little bit about um, that uh, grouping or formation. Um, and it, it relates to Miter Vang's work, whose uh, poetry uh, has always blown me away. Um, we invited Miter Vang uh, to come to UCR. This was, a, I don't know, 2016. Uh, and it was because of um, the Critical Refugee Studies Collective that uh, I'm a part of, and we were able to get a big grant from um, UC Irvine. All roads lead back to UC Irvine, I think it, it seems like. Um, but so the conference was at UCR um, and it, it, it talked about refugee aesthetics, um, talked about refugee histories, and um, the collective is keen on um, <clears throat> Um, what is it, archiving the works of artists whose works are, are not often um, um, appreciated enough in elite literary and artistic circles. That's not the case for Minder Vang uh, in any way, but uh, that was part of the point uh, for us as a collective to invite artists to talk with uh, historians, sociologists about refugee conditions. Um, and I, I have to say too that um, um, the, the reason why um, I was part, I am part of this collective is the kinds of personal stories that bring me to, um, to um, the study of refugees and uh, Miter Vang, um, Nyan, Wendy's uh, and uh, Karen's work, um, that critical and creative impulse I think is uh, underlies the collection and uh, inspires me to um, 
always think about those kinds of threads coming together. So thank you for the question, Christine. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for that question. I'm just going to jump in really quickly to add to, to what Lon has shared, who um, who I have to say, um, Lon, is you are someone who's inspired me just being able to see the work and advocacy you've done to promote critical refugee studies. You're really um, at the fore of it. And um, it was an honor to take part in that um, event. But um, yeah, I, I think when I think about um, my, uh, you know, the work that I'm doing um, and the, the small community that I'm part of, um, I do recognize too and acknowledge that um, that because I'm writing nowadays doesn't mean that that you know my community and Hmong people didn't have a kind of literacy back then, you know, right? It was it was just it's just not literacy in the way that we think of what literacy is today. Um, I mean, Hmong people have a very rich oral tradition, um, and there's a practice called a gutsia, which is sung poetry. And to me, that that that's the form that you know that um, I think I feel rooted in. Um, you know, we write today because we we because the West tells us to write. You know, and um, and so for me, I it's it's still a question for me about you know what 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 um, what roots me in terms of why I why I put pen to page still. Um, but but yeah, I think I think these are still things that we contend with and will always contend with as writers of color. And um, and I really appreciate how critical refugee studies is uh, can create a space for us to have those kinds of conversations moving forward. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, you know, briefly and again, so folks in the audience, please, any questions you might have. Uh, join us in the conversation here. But I, I mean, the next question is um, kind of connecting uh, both Nyan's piece and Wendy's as well. And I guess to go back to creative process, um, and then Nyan, we've mentioned that you referenced earlier historical um, early Asian American artists, right? And uh, working in certain traditions. And Wendy, in your essay, you have um, a, a mix of photographs, right? Um, some archival, right? From the National Archive and the LA Public Library. Uh, but I wonder for you both, if you could talk about the form of vernacular photography, um, because that is something that connects both of your works and what the vernacular or what the kind of everyday photographs, you know, Wendy, that you take and Nyan that your parents take do, right? Um, either in your essay or even in, in your larger work. That's a great question. Um, I I actually was just um, teaching a grad seminar, Archives and Subculture, and one of the places where people really connected was when we started talking about vernacular photography and how many different possible um, opportunities there were uh, for different ways of creating work that could be shared, uh, that was shared on an intimate scale, that could be moved in different directions, that ends up, you know, as um, Lan was suggesting, you know, ends up in like um, swap meets and in um, and in a, and people's estate sales and stuff like that. Um, this is something that I think is really important for us to recognize that the the creation of people's lives through uh, and what they see and what they want to be an entry point to, as as Wendy was suggesting with landscape photography, is such an important element to try to. Um, speculate about what people were thinking or feeling or why did they see things with a particular perspective or why did they share them in a particular way. Um, that to me is really exciting and I'd love to hear more from Wendy who knows much more about this and has been steeped in it much more than I have. Yeah, I mean, I think so. Um, each photograph is a story that somebody was trying to tell, right, how it was framed. Um, you know, and so I think looking at, you know, just going back to Nyan's images, his, his parents' photographs of Yosemite, you know, I think of, for example, like contrasting that with Ansel Adams's photographs of Yosemite, right, where people are cropped out, any kind of human trace are cropped out, right, and you just get the sort of sublime, sublime, quote unquote, pure landscape, you know, so I think vernacular photographs are, are um, often intentionally are not working against kind of hegemonic ways of seeing, right? So they offer a way for us to 
um, to uncover those unknown or um, unseen or erased or um, counter hegemonic ways of um, existing and being in the world, you know. Um, so th there's so much. I mean, <laughs> I could talk for another hour on it, but I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you both. Um, so I want to turn to one of our first audience questions from Kelsey, uh, and this is for all panelists. Um, and it's a pretty broad question, but maybe in that way it works really well. Is um, so the question is, what is the impact you're hoping um, these works, maybe the anthology as a whole, or your own essay might have on people? Maybe just the broadest sense of empowering storytelling, of recognizing that not only I think at a moment when Asian Americans are are at the out of a moments of violence are being asked to you know speak and to uh, declare their words and their lives um, and justify or um, articulate their existence, it's really important to recognize the ways in which people have been telling stories about their lives. Their voices have been demanded to be listened to in different ways. And some of those insistent demands are very um, interpersonal and communal and in particular locations. And they don't necessarily ne need to always be nationalized in order for them to be uh, so valuable for us to um, communicate and, and address and critically engage with. And so that's what I really hope that this will, will do. It will sort of inspire more people to uh, write and share and create and uh, feel like there are platforms that are important for them to communicate to the people they want to communicate to. I can try to answer too uh, from my vantage point. So um, I'm at USC in the Cinema and Media Studies Department. And uh, when the massacre happened in Atlanta, um, or right before that, I was also, I was asked to comment on that. Um, but I was also asked to talk about Asian American representations at the Oscars. Uh, so there is, as Nayan is talking about, this need for us to be more visible, to speak up and to um, be active uh, or um, um, more visible. And um, I actually don't want to uh, talk to these uh, journalists who ask me out of the blue, uh, what do you think about Asian American representation? Because really um, that would take many more hours than just a 30 minute uh, or a one minute soundbite. So I guess I, I agree with Nayan uh, uh, wholeheartedly that we need more stories. We need um, uh, more an appreciation for the kinds of stories that we tell. Uh, we need academics to uh, listen and um, hear what um, people are saying, um, the, the most underprivileged communities, uh, how they speak, what they're saying. Um, and I, I, I have, uh, what is it? And I would like to also po um, posit that academics could, uh, as this book has um, showed so ably, could really tell different stories uh, by being both critical and creative in their writing. So I, I appreciate that this book, it uh, allows that kind of platform for us to rethink what academic writing might look like um, and be able to braid together um, our memories, uh, our transnational um, images and all the things that uh, we are composed of. I can, um, you know, kind of follow on what what, what Lon was saying, and also answer uh, Laura King's question um, in the in the chat too. You know, just kind of reflecting on how um, this past year, you know, might have influenced how we could imagine contributing this volume, contributing to this this volume. And um, one thing I was as I was preparing for this event is that it just felt like such a relief and joy to be participating in this event and not um, an event about anti-Asian racism or trying to explain, you know, the global history of imperialist 
horrors and violence and, and so on, right? And um, something I think that's really powerful about this volume is all of the joy <laughs> that's in it and all of the, you know, big and little ways that people make their lives, you know? And so I think uh, for me, you know, um, the landscapes and the photographs are also hopefully an invitation to people to look at what they might think of as the most boring or mundane or unremarkable spaces around them um, to kind of lean into their own joys and the ways they make their lives and try to think about them in these larger contexts, right? To participate in these larger conversations. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of share that as an, as an answer to both of these questions that have come up. Well, um, Nyan's work uh, made me remember um, uh, the work of Ben Don. Uh, he's a, a photographer and um, he, he also has been doing photographic work uh, on, on national parks, but in particular Yosemite. And uh, he was also doing the, um, the old, you know, he was using old photographic methods to make these fo photographs, to bring them to life in, in um, black and white. And I, I forget the technique, it's on tin or whatever, um, on metal. But uh, he, one of the things that I thought was very interesting he, that he said about the national parks is that it's, it's the introduction that immigrants have to uh, belonging. And it's the, the moment in which he felt that um, we begin to belong to uh, a national space or, um, or the, the space of the state here. And I, I thought that was, um, an interesting way to talk about. And so when I saw the, the photographs of your, your parents, it, it reminded me that this, this is what we did every summer. We went camping, we, um, we went, and they're, they're all, I mean, <laughs> there must be pictures of everyone in front of those falls <laughs> um, and at Half Dome. And, um, and I don't think it's a mistake that uh, Obata was there doing painting that that my grandmother, who was a student of Obata, painted that, that, um, that I have paintings by her of Sumia that she tried over and over to um, paint. So that sense of both the natural space, the landscape, but also the belonging, that she was an American through, through that experience, um, I think it's very clear. So how, do, how are we Californians, you know? Okay. Um, well, thank you everyone for those responses. I mean, I will briefly say uh, in response to Kelsey's question, I think for Lucy and I, um, what we hope to get out or hope kind of transmits right through this anthology too, um, is a kind of modeling of, um, you know, not just what Lon said in terms of what we as scholars can uh, activate of the creative, right, in our writing, but also just a return, a continual return to conversations that we constantly have with artists or across these kind of artist um, scholarly divides, right, that we really work to blur those and that I think um, as we are returning to reopenings and so on and so forth, it is one thing that I really look forward to is just breaking bread. Um, or having a coffee or a cocktail with all of the people um, on this panel. Uh, and I'll also say just for myself as someone who's left California, um, that, you know, um, as opposed to the kind of traveling DVDs of California, um, that there's a way in which I can continually return to California by returning to the pieces um, in this anthology. Uh, but at the same time, I, I really um, wanna kind of echo what other folks are saying about that I hope that uh, some of these stories, um, some of these histories, right, uh, told in various registers, so really, uh, expand folks' vision and, and dreamscape, right, of the state of California, and particularly what it means uh, for, for APIDA, um, API, Desi Americans um, who live in it. So thank you again to our panelists. Thank you again to Vision and Voices, and thank you all uh, to our uh, audience members who are still here and joined us tonight.
Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Nayan, Wendy, Karen, Lan, Miter, and um, Daria, Marie, David, all the uh, our attendees here. And again, to answer Laura's question, I hope that the alternative routes that are mapped in these stories be the guide to a different kind of world that we open ourselves to when we reopen. That's really what I, it's a big hope, but it's a big, it's dream. We dream should not have boundaries. We should dream as, as, as and, and not be bound to reality, y'all. That's why it's called dream. So I think we'll end here now. Thank you, everyone. It's so wonderful to see you. Can't wait to, to break bread together.